We've all had that one athlete who, in our minds, could do no wrong, always made the right play at the right time, and never seemed to falter under pressure, who made plays so naturally that it seemed, well, unnatural. In the early 1930s, Hollywood had its breath taken away, not by an actor or a musician, but by a mysterious amateur golfer. This is what you don't know about John Montague. Welcome to What You Don't Know About Sports, where we delve into the forgotten stories, teams, and athletes of sports history, and question widely held takes on today's sports. I'm Blake, and this is Matt. Howdy. And today, we want to tell you the story about the best golfer you've never heard of, John Montague. So, Matt, before we get started, I wanted to ask you, and I might already know the answer, but that's okay, we want to talk about it anyway, who's the best golfer? that you ever seen judging uh judging just off of what i've seen and it kind of fits with the intro that you threw out there uh it's got to be tiger woods i mean i i don't know that anybody in this generation would come up with a different answer and our generation would come up with a different answer um a younger golf fan a zillennial golf fan might would hit up a different person because they didn't see the full Tiger Woods, but you're talking about somebody that just always seems to pull out the the right thing at the right time and just seems to come through in the moment. There's only certain athletes, period, that do that. And in golf, for a generation, it was Tiger. Um, just when you were talking about that intro, what I had in my head was like the, the 09 U.S. Open where it went to that extra day and everybody could see that Tiger's hurting. And you could, you just watched, it was two guys, him and Rocco mediate playing 18 holes of golf heads up and you just see every shot he hits just tearing him apart, but he gutted through it and wins. I mean, it's ridiculous. That one shot they always play from the masters too, where on like the 16th hole he's behind the green chipping onto it. And it just, it's trickling, it's trickling, it's trickling and it just stops and then it rolls in. I mean, just unbelievable moments so um tiger woods and then the idea that he couldn't do any wrong you know that also fits yeah that, that is a that is an interesting comparison because i would also say the same thing that tiger's definitely the best golfer i've ever seen i i every time i see him on a tee which has been more recently than a little bit farther in the past uh because he, re- he recently won a masters anyway but Every time I see him on a tee, I just imagine him driving off, driving out of the tee box and then just falling to his knees because he was just so hurt. And it was, it's unreal to think about some of the stuff that he did as a golfer. And those shots that you mentioned are just legendary. So got to give it to him. He is, he's by far the best golfer I've ever seen. And golfers aren't supposed to do stuff like that. Like golfers are in our stereotypical mindset, they are like the, the dainty sport, right? Like it's just a bunch of wealthy dudes out here wasting their time. They're not supposed to be playing through an ACL tear, right? But it happened. So impressive. Speaking of athletic achievements, do I have a story for you? So our story today about John Montague begins in Hollywood, California in the early 1930s. It's almost been a hundred years, okay? So this John Montague fella, he suddenly appeared at public golf courses in the Hollywood area, and he immediately drew attention. His physical presence, he was a big, stocky guy, uh, good-looking, according to reports. Uh, He carried with him an oversized set of golf clubs, like weighing twice as much as the average golf club at the time did. 
And everything he did just caught the attention of people. He was truly a golfing wonder, not only because of his physical presence and his good looks, but he was good, okay? He could hit shots that you wouldn't believe. And we're going to get into them, but I w- tell me if you understand any of these. He would, he would hit stuff around trees. He would hit stuff over buildings. He would intentionally bury balls in sand traps and hit them out exactly where he wanted them to go. And the rumors of some of the trick shots that he made, I mean, they they would amaze Tiger. I'm, Tiger may even know about this dude, but he would they he would have amazed Tiger Woods if he had seen it. So there's a few of these, and I want to run through them real quick. Rumor number one: He was seen to have pointed out a string of birds sitting on a telephone wire about 175 yards away from a tee box. He picked out a single bird of that flock sitting on the line, and he struck it with his three wood. Just that 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 is a rumor. My uh, my brother. This is my test to see if he's actually listening to the podcast. He once he once hit a driver uh, on a hole and struck a power line behind it. That was mm, two seventy five, three hundred. We're amateur golfers, so that was impressive. Uh, hit a power line, or at least we he claims it hit a power line. It may have hit a dead bird. Who knows? Uh, he's never done it since. So uh, <laughs> it's very it's very hard to just pick a spot like that with a golf ball. Come on, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to buy that one. Yeah. That's that's difficult. But if you could do it, well, my God, well, yeah, that's that's a good one. So pro- so rumor number two, he would prop windows to a clubhouse open with only a glass of water. So like, imagine the width of a water glass, and he would chip balls through into the building, into the cracked window, without hitting the window or hitting the building, like as many times as you wanted him to. I know my irons don't work like that, but if his work that good, then then by all means. And the third one is really funny. He would he supposedly has been seen hitting a box of matches off of the head of a cocker spaniel, and the dog never moved. So someone sat a box of matches on the dog's head, and he would chip a golf ball and knock the box of matches off without hitting the dog, without even making okay, the dog flinch. That. I'm I'm going to go like all of these are impressive, right? All of these are impressive. That is hard because that, you know, the dog is not at a normal height for what you would be hitting a golf shot. That would be you standing uh, below your ball <laughs> in a way. So he's really having to hit a different shot completely than he would normally do to hit a ball off of a dog's head. So that's impressive. The the iron trick through a door cracked open is is that might be the best one, actually, because I would need the door wide open and probably uh, to be the size of a battleship to make sure that it was going to work out. So. <laughs> OK, right. And sometimes that, if I are... just want to put a ball through an open door, I need the door wide open. I'm yeah. like. Sometimes those those sound like things you would see on TikTok and they would have 50 takes and show you the good one. Like I don't that could to that do could it in true. front of people. I, I don't know how many times he got it wrong because of course you know these these tall tales the bad ones don't live only the good ones right. do. So who knows right, how right. often he did it and messed it up to get it right. But we'll I don't know. We'll never know I guess, but not only was he... It was the 1930s, too, so anything goes. Like, anybody could have said anything, <laughs> and it's fine. Yeah, every, ah, he totally did that. Mm-hmm. And and again, these tall tales live on, and they only get bigger as time goes on, too. So yeah. not only about these trick shots were crazy, because of his physical presence, he would also out-drink, out-eat, and out-arm wrestle anybody. It is also said that he would just pick up the end of a car if someone needed if someone needed to change a tire on the car, he would just squat it or deadlift it up off the ground. You didn't need a jack. Just call John. He'd walk over and just pick up the car for you. No big deal. You didn't need a jack. Uh, this is getting Paul Bunyan like now. I don't know. <laughs> I I don't know. Uh, John Henry, swing your hammer. Like I don't know how. Okay. I'm gonna believe it. Maybe I'm they built cars it. lighter back then. That doesn't seem right, but. <laughs> no it doesn't but I'm going to believe it just because 
so he would also he was a betting man so he would make bets on absolutely anything he apparently had a few that stuck out in the research that i did he bet someone once that he could drive a golf ball three quarters of a mile in just five shots that's a long way a mile is like 1700 yards Divided by five is 300 and some change. And he did that. He said he could do that five times. He could drive a ball three quarters of a mile in five shots. That's like some super muscle Bryson DeChambeau driving. <laughs> okay, that is that is some Bryson DeChambeau stuff. Like we're just going to hit the ball as hard as we can. And I could do it. I could do it in six shots as long as it didn't all have to go the same direction. So that's what I'm wondering is if they chose like a, a road that was three quarters of a mile long. I don't know. You never know. Yeah, mine would mine would be in the right to the right every time. But we'll, he, I believe that he did it. He would also he also bet somebody that he could chip onto the practice green through a clubhouse window. So similar to similar to the cracking of the window, but he would start inside the building, chip it out the window without hurting anybody or anything, and. He also would make bets with people that he would stack and bury three golf balls in a sand trap, one on top of the other, and then he would only hit the middle one out of the sand. <laughs> and the like top the top one would just fall. I think I love that's it. hilarious. I would have loved to see some of this stuff, by the way. Yeah, but I love this. This is great. So eventually he would become a member of Lakeside Golf Course, which is a very infamous or famous, I guess golf club in the Hollywood area, and he would soon become the club champion. Now, Lakeside Golf Course was really, really well known, had a ton of famous celebrity members like Oliver Hardy, Johnny Weissmuller, Howard Hughes, Humphrey Brogart, Bing Crosby, lots of famous people, okay? And there's one story in particular. <laughs> Humphrey, oh, Bogart. Humphrey I can't even do it right. <laughs> But there's one story in particular uh, that stuck out, and this is what started to get him famous in, in the amateur golf world. So Bing Crosby met him eventually, and they played a bunch of rounds of golf, and Montague would just beat Crosby heads up one after another after another after another. And one day Crosby said, you know what? All these bad lies and these these conditions I can't control – that's why I keep losing. And, and Montague said, uh, no, you're wrong. I'm just better at golf than you. Now, mind you, Bing Crosby played a lot of golf, apparently. Like some days he would play two full rounds in a day when he wasn't doing anything. So he played a lot of golf, probably a scratch golfer at some point in his life. And Montague would beat him heads up every single time. So eventually Crosby and Montague bet each other that Montague would beat him in one hole on a par four with nothing but a baseball bat a shovel and a rake. This was a real bet, apparently. Like, and this is a story that has lasted all these years, but I also believe this happened. So they made this bet. Montague goes to his car and grabs these three items from his trunk. Now, is that not suspicious? Who's who's driving around with a baseball bat, shovel, and a rake in the car? For one thing, <laughs> sir, what are you doing? What are you doing with these items? Are you a landscaper? Are you a groundskeeper for the local Sibby Pro baseball team? What are you doing? Uh, especially <laughs> with the shovel, sir. Like nobody has a shovel. It's Hollywood. This is California, correct? California? It, Holly, yeah, it doesn't snow there. So why do you have what for what purpose is this shovel? Concert. This this is a suspicious moment in this time, and I don't know why. Uh, don't know why they thought he was just cool, just driving around with these items in his car. They get to the tee box. Montague goes first. He throws the golf ball up into the air and hits it with the baseball bat. It apparently goes 350 yards, and it lands in a greenside bunker. He then shovels the ball out of the sand trap with the shovel within eight feet of the pin, and then he sunk the ball on his third shot using the rake like a pool cue. He got down on all fours, and he <laughs> doink, putted it in for three. And, of course, 
Crosby achieved a par with all of his normal clubs, a drive, a chip, and two putts. So my initial question was actually going to be, when you said baseball bat, uh, does he get to, does he have to hit the baseball bat off, the ball off the tee with the baseball bat? But no, he threw it up in the air. So, So this is what questions the validity of the story, because if you were putting this together from scratch and you were like baseball bat, rake, and shovel, it would be... I'm going to I'm going to swing and hit the baseball or the 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 golf ball with the bat. I'm going to shovel it out of the bunker and then I'm going to cue ball it in with the rake. Like that's exactly how you would tell the story and it worked out that way, but again, we know from Tiger Woods sometimes you the the way the story should go is exactly how it goes. It's seems suspicious though. Old Bing is a good storyteller. What I want to know is what else was in his trunk? If he's driving around with a baseball bat, a shovel, and a rake, what else was he carrying? That's what that that is something that I would like to know. I know from listening to crime junkies that if it's also <laughs> if it's also a tarp and cleaning supplies, oh, okay. it's a bad look. Okay. So, <laughs> so that's that's all that was missing uh, from the murder kit. Yeah, because because you gotta you gotta rake up their leaves after you kill them, right? Like anyway. Well, yeah. So this story, as good as it was, it spread like wildfire. People started noticing that Montague was in California and that he was hitting a really good golf ball, making trench shots, betting people and all that stuff. 1926 U.S. amateur champ George Von Elm was quoted as saying that Montague was, quote, the greatest golfer I ever saw. That's impressive. But maybe the more impressive part is that Montague didn't want any part of the notoriety. At one point, he played around with Grantland Rice, famous sports writer. Played around with Grantland Rice, and he was on the 18th tee box about to break the course record. He needed a par on the 18th hole to break the course record. He intentionally smacks the ball as hard as he can into the woods, tells his caddy to go get it, and he walks into the clubhouse. Rice says, what are you doing? You almost you could set the course record here. What are you doing? And he goes, I don't want to be known for that. So... He's so good, but he doesn't want it. He doesn't want any of the notoriety for being good. He's just this, this folklore character. And he was okay with that. He didn't want any pictures. He didn't want any publicity and he, and he didn't try going pro. So he wanted anonymity so much that when people took pictures of him, he would pay the photographer for the film and then destroy it. Like that's how intentional he was about people not seeing his picture and not knowing what was going on with him. You know, uh, that's, it's actually surprising. I mean, I know that he's playing with celebrities, but it's celebrities from the 1930s. It's a different world. They were at the time very good about having their celebrity persona and their real persona. So they were good at hiding. It wouldn't have been a terrible thing to, if you wanted anonymity, anonymity to be around celebrities, they could provide it for you. Although in public, you know, a lot of people wanted to see them, uh, but playing with a newspaper author, uh, the likes of Grantland Rice is like, well, what are you? I mean, I, we know that he's a gambler. We know that he likes to take chances. We know that he has odd things in his trunk. But the gambling part really, you know, for an, an anonymous kind of guy to play with Grantland Rice, for people that don't know, he would probably be the top sports writer of the 1930s. I don't even know what the equivalent would be. Scott Van Pelt? No, like Bob Costas, somebody like Maybe that. Costas. <laughs> um, that that's just super well known. So, hmm. I guess the question is why is he doing all this? What's the curiouser deal? and curiouser? So, of course, no one knew where he was from. No one knew where he came from, who he was, how he got his money. He was making all these bets. He was playing all this golf. He was wearing nice clothes. He was driving fast cars. But nobody knew anything about him. But nobody really asked either because, like you said, in this celebrity realm in Hollywood, especially 100 years ago almost, there was a lot of shelter from the outside world in that realm. You could get away with stuff like this. And eventually he was given the nickname Mysterious Montague, which seems to fit, right? Well, I mentioned Grantland Rice earlier. He became a member of Lakeside Golf Club. And like you mentioned, he was a one-man sports conglomerate. He did 
a sports column that was read by more than 10 million people. He wrote books. He wrote featured articles. He even wrote scripts for movie shorts. He had his own radio show. He edited a magazine called American Golfer. While he was based in New York, he spent two months every year in L.A. I believe it said that after the football season, but before spring training, he would come to California. So it'd be like January, February to March, April. He shows up. He starts playing with everybody. He meets all the new people. And then eventually he meets Montague. He plays one round with John Montague. And he was he was quoted as saying that he believed all the tall tales he had ever heard. He was hearing all this stuff from 3,000 miles away. So he had to come see it for himself. As soon as he got here, he played one round with him. He believed it all. And at this point, Rice started writing. What do writers do? They write. So he started writing about Montague for his column. And the first known publishing about Montague was in January of 1935. He would eventually write enough about Montague that one of his last publishings about him was basically to ask him to put up or shut up, that he's good enough to be great. And what is the re- what is, what's the reason that you don't want to be in the public eye? What's the reason you don't want people taking pictures of you? What are the reasons? Like t- The world deserves to know. Golf deserves to know. I deserve to know. Everybody deserves to know who you are and what you could really do. And you're just hiding in Hollywood. Why? And eventually, uh, he published that put up or shut up thing. And then also Time Magazine reported on Montague, but they were really specific. So they gave stuff like height, weight, body type, all kinds of demographic details, really descriptive stuff about Montague. And they eventually published this in Time Magazine as well. I'm just thinking that a guy that wants to destroy film, pay off a photographer and destroy film is not the kind of guy that wants press from Time Magazine. You can't pay off a photographer from Time Magazine to destroy a picture. If they want a picture, they're going to get a picture and they're going to publish it. You may be friends with Grantland Rice enough to get him to not publish your picture and just put your name in there, but not Tom. Uh, when Tom shows up, this this whole anonymous thing is even more done than it was with, with Rice. So... <laughs> I can't, I'm, I'm assuming we find out his, uh, his, his, uh, his situation here. Eventually, I believe it was time. Someone eventually had to like hide behind a tree and use a really high powered lens or hide in a bush and use a really high powered lens to take pictures of him, to publish them. Because if he found, I mean, he was this pretty intimidating dude. So if he found out that you were, I mean, he's carrying around a shovel and a baseball bat in his trunk. So you don't want to be the dude that's like, he asks you for his picture back and you tell him no. I wouldn't do that. So they had to hide and do it inconspicuously. Well, you might be asking, why is this a big deal? Well, yeah. all the while, New York State Police Inspector John Cozart was working an armed robbery case in the Adirondacks of New York from seven years prior when he found the Time article about John Montague. Cozart said that he couldn't believe that the similarities between his outstanding suspect and Montague could possibly be a coincidence. And within days, John Montague was arrested by LAPD on July 9th, 1937, for armed robbery. You also may be wondering... How could Montague go so long without being recognized? Well, while in jail in Los Angeles, Montague admitted that his real name was Laverne Moore and that he was actually from Syracuse, New York. Time Magazine is a narc. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. Time Magazine. So this dude has been playing golf with Bing Crosby, and he's Laverne. Laverne what? Laverne Moore is his real name. Laverne Moore has been out here uh, lifting cars and lifting money, apparently. And so, wow. Wow. Okay, so now, okay, but if you're Grantland Rice... And you wrote this big put up or shut up article. Tell me, tell me what's going on. Don't you feel like a giant, like idiot? (laughs) You were confronting someone who was willing to rob someone at gunpoint. 
about their reasons for being anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, about that. <laughs> Enter Laverne Moore from Syracuse, New York. He grew up in Syracuse. He was from a blue-collar family. He was allegedly a very active child. He excelled at sports, most sports, baseball, football, basketball, skiing, pool, and golf. His first experience with a golf ball was apparently he found one in the street, and then he made a club out of an old gas pipe elbow and a broom handle when he was a kid. He was also a former minor league pitcher, reputed rum runner, and of course, a fantastic golfer, which is probably the only reason he got away with it so long is because he got into this like secretive crowd all the way across the country, and... He made it. He made it a long time without being caught. Golf saves. Golf is a life-saving uh, endeavor, everyone. Time on the golf course is time well spent. It can save you from uh, potential jail time, apparently. That's the moral of the story, children. Surprise. Any children that are listening, that's not true. All right. Don't, don't do that. So in August of 1937, he was extradited from Los Angeles to New York for trial his friends in Hollywood provided their big-time lawyers to defend him because he had made friends with all these people. He'd been out there for years at this point. The trial was actually held in October of 1937 in Elizabethtown, New York, a quiet little sleepy town in the Adirondacks. And press from all over the place came in. Uh, the New York Mirror was quoted as saying that this was the first big sports page trial since the Black Sox scandal, which was 1919, so about 20 years before this happened. This was the biggest sports story bef- until this happened. So all of this to say they put new they had to install phone lines and all this stuff into the courthouse and it was a it was a packed. So the trial starts and then the details of the robbery start coming out. Well, on August 4th, 1930, four men in two cars drove to a roadhouse restaurant. Three of the four went inside. The three men bound and gagged all the occupants except for the owner of the roadhouse. We're going to call her Mrs. Hannah. Mrs. Hannah was ordered to the wall safe in another room, opened it, and gave the robbers the contents of the safe. It was about 800 bucks. While this was going on, John Cobb, who was Mrs. Hannah's father, attacked one of the robbers as they exited the other room. A second robber joined the scuffle and struck Cobb with a pistol. It was at this point that Cobb allegedly falls out of the window outside of the building, The robber with the pistol follows them, and they continue to struggle until the robber beats Cobb with the pistol multiple more times before they escape. Later that night, a car chase involving one of the two suspect vehicles with state police yielded one of the robbers dead, and the other one was captured. The second suspect vehicle was allegedly stopped at some point, but they were allowed to leave. So they got away with it that time, apparently. I uh, I think I read that Laverne Moore gave fictitious information of course and they let him go and then the driver of the second vehicle was eventually captured so that's three out of the four and the fourth robber escaped and this was believed to be laverne moore moore's travels after that he allegedly left home told his mother he was leaving went down to florida ended up in mexico and then came up into california that way and that's how he ended up in hollywood wow man i we keep telling these stories that I feel like would be perfect movies if this isn't already a movie. Like, this is the perfect, like, no war, no war, no war, no war, no war type deal where, like, the <laughs> the dude can't solve the case. And then Time Magazine just sits on his desk and he's like, oh, my God, I found him. We got we got 1930s car chases. No, this would have been 1920s car chases. Mm-hmm. And we got we got the close call where our our uh, anti hero lead is almost caught in the first ten minutes of the movie. This is this is just perfect. This is a great. Oh my gosh! This is so, good stuff, right? so he just moves around the country after he after he commits this act. So I guess he's got some of the money. I guess actually he's probably got half the money, right? Because he's the only one that didn't get captured out of the two cars. So he's able to to fund his his stuff. Probably gives him enough to get started out there in Cali. Yeah, wow. yeah. Took a really interesting route to get there from New York to Florida. Somehow ended up in Mexico. Came up into the United States and 
John Montague was born. So the testimony of this trial was really interesting, I thought. So Mrs. Hannah and one of her daughters heard, or t- they testified that they heard one robber call another Vern, which is which I thought was interesting and pretty incriminating. But then one robber claimed that Moore was part of the group and one didn't. One said that he wasn't there. Moore's mother then testifies, and she claimed that he was asleep at home in bed that night. His two sisters corroborated the mother's story, but personal items were found in the trunk of one of the suspect vehicles belonging to Moore. But a friend of Moore testified that he and Moore were hitting golf balls at a driving range the night of the crime. And then Moore eventually took the stand, and he kind of recalled the last seven years of his life, everything that he was doing since 1930 and the robbery, all the way up to when he was captured. And then after five hours of deliberation, Moore was acquitted with a not guilty verdict. The judge was quoted as saying afterwards, I am sorry to say your verdict is not in accord with the one I think you should have rendered, but that's up to you and not to me. Oh, so they found him not guilty. Okay. So it's, it's hard to do, right? Because they don't have, they didn't have the ability other than the items in the trunk. That's physical evidence that I, they could trace, but they don't have the ability to have physical evidence in this situation. It's just witness testimony. These people heard Vern. They saw somebody that looked like him, but other people give him an alibi, corroborate the alibi. Uh, although two different alibis, he was either asleep at night or hitting, you know, balls at the driving range couldn't be both i guess unless it's two different you know time and periods that they're looking at but so you you have to weigh the two things and i guess the guy with the flashy hollywood lawyer is the the winner in those situations usually so that's that's not the way i saw this going (laughs) the start of the trial part i didn't i didn't see that okay all right so he's innocent in the eyes of the law Not guilty. Well, then, of course, after the trial, he has nothing to hide from, right? So what does he do? Press, photos, amateur public golf matches with Babe Ruth, for goodness sakes. That's his first public exhibition golf match after the trial. It happened in November of 1937, so about a month. He played an exhibition golf match with Babe Ruth. Babe Didrikson, who was an LGPA pro and won 10 majors. I didn't realize that. And then an amateur golfer named Sylvia Annenberg. So many spectators, this happened in Long Island, I believe. So many spectators came to watch that it was canceled prior to the completion of the ninth hole. They had to wait so long because the crowd's following you, of course. And they would they would block the fairways. And they would there was just so many people there. They ended up having to cancel the exhibition match before it was even halfway over because of how many people wanted to show up and see this guy play. I think this is an opportune time to point out that celebrity worship is not new, people. It's not a new thing. Uh, this guy is acqu- an acquitted, uh, an acquitted potential, probably armed robber, and because he's innocent and because he's famous, he's playing golf matches with actual famous athletes, um, and people are showing up in droves. This idea that. We are the first time in history that we fawn over people. Clearly not, because because this guy has a following, and I can't blame people for wanting to see what's going on with him. I mean, this is an interesting dude for the yeah, time. Because at some point, when the word got out through Time Magazine and through Grantland Rice's stuff, people started becoming curious. And then, of course, the press covering the trial was like, oh, well, John Montague, a.k.a. Laverne Moore. So then he got linked together with with his pseudonym or his alias. He got linked by both names. So then when you see a public exhibition golf match with Babe Ruth and John Montague, you're like, oh, I'm going to come see this guy. And that fame is probably what got him out of this because jury deliberation and jury selection is terrible anyway. Keeping yeah. bias out of jury selection is is impossible. You do the best you can. And a hundred years ago, they might not have cared. I know today it was terrible, and that had to play a role because the jurors knew who he was, and he was this flashy guy, this good-looking guy, this 
this physical specimen of a guy, it play it has to play a role. It had to play a role in his in his acquittal. But nonetheless, he secretly marries Esther Plunkett, who already had children, but then he was supplied financial support by her. And then kind of after that public exhibition golf match, he started falling out of the public eye. So he got very heavily into drinking. He he already drank. He would already drink anyone under the table, but he attempted to go pro in golf. He qualified for the U.S. Open in 1940, and he missed the cut. He gained a lot of weight, and he hadn't played golf in a couple years. So even though it was still his love, his passion, he just couldn't do it at a professional level. But he compl- he continued playing golf in exhibitions. He kind of lived on the trick shots and the prior fame of everything that happened to him. And then, unfortunately, in 1947, his wife dies. And within two years of that happening, he was arrested for drunk driving and he had a heart attack. In 1963, so 16 years after his wife died, apparently he fell off a ladder and he was hospitalized for almost two months. And then, again, unfortunately, in May 25th, 1972, he drank himself to death, had a heart attack in his hotel room in LA. There's a story behind that day. He had basically become this town drunk. Like if you just think of like the old movies and you have this town drunk guy who showed up and he was obnoxious and he was, he was just drunk all the time. That's what it does. So he lost a lot of friends, a lot of the friends that he knew, a lot of the friends that got him through the trial. He lost their trust after a while. He would just be obnoxious around people and he was betting, he was losing money and he was asked, he was begging people for money. Well, so the friend that helped him out, his name was Albert Abrams. He was a LA-based photographer and a real estate investor. Abrams said, "Hey, your story is really cool. We want to make a short film based on your life, and I want you to play it. And then we're going to take that short film to a studio and sell the idea to them. And then Jackie Gleason was allegedly going to play Montague in a full-length film. Well, of course, Gleason never got the chance to." play Montague in a film because Montague couldn't stay away from alcohol long enough. And then Abrams was actually quoted as saying, quote, John, I can't take it anymore. I can't waste any more time. You've ruined the last chance you'll ever have, which is an incredibly hard thing to do because you're the only one who at this point still cares about him. And then like, eventually you got to let it go too. Like you got to feel bad. And then of course, knowing he died, he allegedly died that night. He went back and drank himself to death. So, so a tragic, terribly tragic yeah. end to the story. But it almost feels like it almost feels like it was tracking that way, right? Like, like if you just said if you just said that he just lived out his years as quietly as a quaint old man, I don't think it would fit the the rest of that, that, that the first part of his life. And so it's one of those things where if you look at it, his, his fame is built on these Herculean things. And when that ability goes away, right, it helps that he was in this lawsuit. It helps that, that, that all this stuff happens, but eventually your physical talents start to, to go down. Right. So he, he qualified for the U S open in 1940. So he'd have been around, 37 years old or something like that. I think I saw he was born in 1903. So that's, that's old for golf. It would have been old for golf in 1940 for sure. I don't know. Um, I can see him not being there and then taking a dive, you know, the gambling, like you said, if that's a thing that you're addicted to, like it very well, we see it a lot in athletes that are so good, right? Tiger is supposed to have a gambling problem. Michael Jordan has the gambling issues surrounding him that went on early in his career. It's the thing you do because you're sure you're going to win and it, that's it. I, I, I'll bet whatever I got to. And if, if this is the one time I don't win, then I'm going to make it up next time because I'm going to win nine out of 10 times. And so that mindset gets you in trouble when you don't have the physical gifts anymore because you think you're still going to, but they're not there. So, you know, just a lot of things that, that play together. That's, unfortunate the way that that ended i am glad somebody decided it should be a movie it's a really tragic story for someone who could have been so great 
And he had some he had some other troubles in his youth, rum runner, like I mentioned earlier. And uh, he had he had he he wasn't new to criminal activity like this armed robbery wasn't his first rodeo. But it is really tragic for someone who was given such a gift uh, to to be athletic and to be so good at a particular sport that he could have done such great things. And we see the stories all the time, like athletic careers get wasted and they're all over the news, but this is definitely one that I had never heard of. And, uh, because, because he, he was never pro. Most of the ones we hear about became pro and then ruined it like uh, an Aaron Hernandez or something. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if he knew, if he knew that he would get acquitted. Right. If you told him upon arriving in California, so we'll let him we'll let him do his runaway to Florida and Mexico. Upon arriving to California and getting into the golf thing and, and making it a habit, if you'd have told him, Hey, turn yourself don't even turn yourself in, just let yourself get caught, you're gonna you're gonna get acquitted. I wonder if he would have done it. I wonder if he would have taken it and then gone ahead and, and gone pro. And then we'd have a different story of him. I'm still hung up on the fact that he was innocent because the more I think about it, the more that it's clearly obvious that <laughs> it was him. Like the, the, you know, the people surrounding him said, one of the robbers even said it was him. Like, come on. I. <laughs> well, they do say that, that so one robber said it was him. One robber said it wasn't. And then the, the police officers were interviewed. They gave testimony uh, the most the most notable one I thought was the fact that the victims remember hearing one of the one of them call another one Vern, which is of course part of his name. So you would think that's pretty incriminating, right? But eyewitness testimony is the weakest form of evidence that you could put in a criminal trial. So the worst. The eyewitness testimony of the victims seven years later, like if he was, he would have been in prison. He would have died in prison if he was caught right away. So getting away got him acquitted. Now, of course, if I think that if if he knew that he would never serve a minute of prison time, like, of course, he was arrested and taken to jail and he bonded out twice before his trial. If he was told, if he knew for sure that he would never set foot in a prison, he would have gave it, he would have, he would have let it go because you could tell he was the kind of person who wanted the attention. He just had to be careful about who he gave it to, like who he, who he told. No one knew who he was actually. And, Speaking of his mother, he just up and left the day after the robbery and didn't speak to her until his trial. Like he never even called his mom because he knew that that was potentially dangerous for him to contact his mother. Uh, he never told his mom what he did, of course, but he just up and left, didn't tell her why, and didn't speak to her for seven years. Man, that's uh, that. This is a story that could only happen in the time period it did. Nineteen thirties. We've said it before. But the 30s through the 70s, I guess the, the, the stories we told at Halloween, the, the mysterious disappearances and appearances, you know, now everything you have fingerprints and everybody wants your social security number and everything else and credit score to, you know, whatever, buy everything. That's a different situation. You cannot just run away and change your name. But in the 1930s, you absolutely could because there is nothing. There's no paper trail. There's nothing. Just have a bad day, have a bad year, and pack your stuff up and move and be whoever you want to be. So a story of the time, a legend of the time period with the stories to accompany it, that's, that's all you can ask for. That was that was a good one. It was a really interesting story, and I'm sure there's tons more out there that that are similar to this one and like the 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 mystery i feel like this this time that we're in today is all mystery based and everybody's listening to true crime podcasts and and everybody loves these like spooky crime stories especially if they overlap with something else like sports or or something like that so i'm sure there's more of these out there we're going to be on the lookout for them if you know of a really cool story that you would like us to research and cover or if you just want to tell a story yourself let us know hit us up on social media by email, whatever you want to do. But yeah, that's that's the story of John Montague, what you don't know about John Montague, or Laverne Moore, depending on who you ask. Until next time, thanks for listening.
Thank you for listening to this episode of What You Don't Know About Sports. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please leave us a review, five stars only, and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen. If you have a great sports story, we want to hear about it. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WYDKAS Podcast and on our YouTube channel at What You Don't Know About Sports Podcast. All episodes are written, recorded, and edited by us. Stay tuned for the next episode. This is a great year for me. The Hornets are going to win a playoff series. Oh. The Hurricanes are going to win a Stanley oh. Cup. The the Yankees are gonna win nothing. I was probably. gonna say, hold up, don't don't even do that. <laughs> but and then Washington's winning the Super Bowl. I all I'll give you this: all four of your teams will make the playoffs. Does that ever happen in your lifetime? That's a good question. In the same That's a good season? question. If they all like in the same calendar year, have they all made the playoffs? Never in my life have all four teams been in the play well hold on yeah never never